Unfortunately for you, you've crash-landed into my car crash of a podcast named This Much Is True, as in the Spandau Ballet song, This Much Is True, and it's day 50 for me, that's right, because we're 51 days into the new year, and I started this on the 2nd of January, so... uh, Minus a few little days where just work uh, caught up with me and family life and stuff. I've been here and I will be, hopefully, uh, until 90 days or 93 days or so have expired. I uh, have a little coffee here. Only a little one. Like a real harmless attempt at a coffee. Because I don't want a big one. Because it's late and I need my sleep, especially after the ridiculous hour I was in this studio till this morning. What was it? Six minutes past... Before I got out of here because of audiobook editing and hello to eagle-eyed Shannon who picked up on the fact that I should have just gone to bed instead of getting on camera. Shannon, I know you're busy down there looking after Joe Duffy's phone calls as, as well as other things. Will you do coffee with me sometime, Shannon? Can I go up into the canteen? No? No? Or I'll be too familiar with you. I only live down the road. Um, um but it's great to have have people listening in, if you are listening, because I think this goes out on podcast as well, or whether you have to be stuck with my ugly mug, you're very welcome in. I'm sitting down here taking the weight off my face for a while, and I just wanted to shoot the breeze with you. I have, oh, before I go anywhere, sorry if you are listening, because you can't see it. So you, behind me here, I have two uh, new pairs of Skechers. I'm not advertising for them, but I just love them. I got a pair over Christmas and they just do the business for me, especially because I don't have to lace up anymore. I just slip into the mother things, right? Uh, that reminds me of a very old joke and it is in bad taste. So if there are children or if you're very sensitive, hang on, before I go through the joke. So look, this is what I was wearing. Look at these. My God, they're like something. What was it? What was that Scottish guy years ago with the vest? Remember him? Yeah, but anyway, it's kind of Wurzel Gummidge shoes. That's what I was wearing to take me from the studio across the little postage stamp of a garden into the house and back. But the Skechers, oh, I'm wearing them everywhere. So, Rabsi Nesbitt. That's what I was trying to think of. Rabsi Nesbitt, okay, the new. Yes, more of this disgusting coffee, please. I don't care what you've been through today. You're safe now. Sit down. The Marco is here. All right. I bet you, speaking of coffee, I could go for a coffee with any of you guys and I would have five or six good things that you weren't even aware of to take away with me, having met you. So I'm getting out more, by the way. I'm meeting Liam tomorrow, I hope, at 4.30. Liam, I won't give you second name. In fact, I won't give second names because it's not fair on people. They don't want to be associated with me. Um... And Liam, Liam and I were in the trenches and sales uh, years ago, and we had some great experiences together. We just bonded. Our fathers were uh, both army men, and uh, but Liam had very high aspirations, and um, and purely it was the quality of his thinking. I did pretty well in in sales, in corporate sales. I was having a, at its best, it was like not having a job and getting paid really good for it because I had a, a clientele that I'd built up. And they weren't going to buy off anyone else but me for a, the longest time anyway. And I mean, they were major blue chip clients. But Liam had designs on running companies, right? And I won't name them, but blue chip ones, certainly three or four. It'll be interesting to catch up. I think he's semi-retired now. The word retirement does not enter my lexicon. Um, I probably won't retire on uh, on the uh, the golden cloud that Liam has, but I'm okay now. The house is paid for, the kids have been educated, and unless, like, the economy really goes tits up, I can cruise it. And I like my voice stuff as well. Want to get back into radio if I could. That's it. I just, I'm never happier than when I was on radio. But um, maybe I'll make my own radio station here. In kind, anyway, with this podcast and stuff, it's good to connect with people. I cannot forget just to remark on what I saw on TikTok recently. It was an old performance by Prince. Remember Prince? Yes, Prince. He died in the lift. And that was wrong on so many levels. I know, that's in poor taste. Uh, By the way, an overdose of fentanyl. That's what it was, or an accidental overdose of fentanyl. 
we lost a genius like that. But the reason I want to mention is, um, mention him is on this TikTok performance, one song, Baby, I'm a Star, right? I couldn't believe just the showmanship. He was incredible. There was like double and treble splits taking place. Everything was like military precision, time to perfection, all the moves in time with the music, the dancers and all, uh, and the backing singers, they were all involved in it. He was an incredible musician, an incredible performer. And this waif-thin little elfin guy, beautiful, you know, looking as well. He was acting it all up. But he was obviously living his dream. I was looking at just this guy, you know, like a Michael Jackson type vibe. This guy is a phenomenon, or was a phenomenon. And what an awful loss at the age of, I think it was, what was it, 57? Passed away in that mad year, 2016. Do you remember we lost all the pop stars that year? David Bowie? Or is it Bowie? I can never tell. Um, and George Michael, of course, my love. I love George Michael. And there were so many big names that year. It was like a cull of pop stars, wasn't it? Really, we, we must list them sometime. But I know Prince was among the casualties of that year. Uh, just to see him. And I thought to myself, well, if this is only one song, what must the whole set be like? You know? Now, by the way, I did see him. And... I had clients at a corporate, I I was entertaining clients, so I was looking after them, but I got them tickets to Prince March 29th, 1995. A month to the day afterwards, I had more clients on a helicopter trip. We had a couple of helicopters in rotation, pardon the pun, and that's where I really got it together with my beloved wife. And less than a year, within less than a year afterwards, we were married. So far, so good. Two grown-up kids now. And uh, one turned 23 yesterday. And she's gone back to America on me. I'm, I'm going to miss her. The other one's in Spain. <laughs> like She's only 21. She's in Spain. But, um, yeah, so it's all kind of happening. But looking at that prince, I just thought, my God, what talent. What a loss of talent. Um, it was, it's worth looking at. You know, check it out. It's probably on YouTube. Um, Baby, I'm a star. Prince. Holy God. But anyway, I was. I was at a concert and he was brilliant, but I can't remember him. I think he was into the NPG thing, New Power Generation. Do you remember when he used to have the Dave on his face or Slave? Slave on his face. <laughs> and someone took the piss out of him and said it was Dave. He had that Slave because he had a, a fight going on with the record company, similar indeed to George Michael. Um, but I remember distinctly the bass. <laughs> and he'd go... Play that motherfucking bass. Boo, boo, boo. Play that motherfucking bass. Anyway, hello to the four or five of you that look in. Um, I'm delighted because, look, where there's more than one gathered, we can we can weave some stuff. So hello again to Shannon today, who uh, contacted me through uh, LinkedIn. She's busy. Um, of course, Nigel. Hi. I am your broomy mate. <laughs> can't really do the accent, can I? You and I should do something. I'll phone you someday, maybe, if you want to come on this program, because you really, Nigel's an interesting life. Um, and Nigel, by the way, put put me right on the clackers. I remember I was talking about clackers there about two episodes ago. These were a phenomenon. They were like, they literally, as their name suggests, you would clack these balls together now. No tittering in the uh, cheap seats. Um, and Nigel revealed to me, because he got onto me on WhatsApp, or WhatsApp, I can never pronounce it, they had originated in Spain in the early 1970s. And you could get really high quality ones or you could get crap ones, which would like explode and everybody would be running for their lives. Yeah, they were like, I don't know, billiard ball landmines that you'd take your... Oh, the other thing about those is the other phenomenon I remember... Do -do 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 -do, I never stopped doing that. Was you'd see them sometimes in the manner of drug dealers with... Um, runners or trainers, you'd see them hanging up on the telephone poles. You'd see, you'd see a pair of clackers where obviously someone was dealing drugs or someone just said, fuck this for a game of soldiers and, excuse my language, threw up the clackers. Yeah, that sounds awful, doesn't it? That sounds like a Chinese meal or something. I've thrown up my clackers. Or is it Scottish? Now that would be a, what would that be? A, a Mars bar, wouldn't it? Now how can I forget my beautiful Yorkshire lass Susan. Susan, 
Susan, I, hang on. Susan, you're going to get it. Now, girl, are you ready? This is all for you, Susan from Yorkshire. There you go. You're getting a belt of me ding ling Susan. By the way, if you do like these podcasts, let other people know about them. Because otherwise, I think in by day 90-something, I think I may be calling it a day. But Susan, yeah, she made contact. Says she likes to listen into the podcast. Hey up, Bonnie girl and um, beautiful Yorkshire lass, Ecky Tump. And um, yeah, it's lovely to hear from you, Susan. Stay in touch. Tell your friends that I'm available for children's parties and bar mitzvahs <laughs> as well. No, but lovely, Susan. Thank you for using the Proton Mail, which is this much is true at protonmail.com. I'm not putting it up tonight. I have my book up here, as you can see, not to blatantly plug it, but to remind me of something that you might enjoy if you stick around. Um, so, yeah, so after the ridiculous start this morning where I really, I went back to bed for a while. I couldn't really sleep. Um... I had a dream. No, I won't tell you what the dream was because I'd be ashamed. Uh, Ray as well. Ray from South East England. Hopefully my old Worthing original. Ray has his own podcast, Ray's Rants. I love Ray and so will you if you check him out. Most relaxing podcast ever. Um, so yeah, I had a, yeah, this mad early start. I had to go back to Black Rock Clinic today. Poor little me in the leafy suburbs. But um, I, I, I was quite bypassed just over five years ago, and I've lived to tell the tale. Um, out of the blue. Never had the heart attack, but anyway, uh, thank God. Um, and apart from one incident, Christmas, two years ago, where I got that thump again, thump, we should say, um, and they couldn't find a correlation. They said, well, I, I said, that's what I got the first time. That's what led to the, they said, yeah, I don't know what it is. That's what led to us investigating your heart disease but we can't make a connection with it. Everything looks fine. Go live your life. So I am happy to do that. But I was back today where I was, basically where I was operated on. And that, that kind of dull light they have, which is great because you don't want it too bright either. But it reminded me of being wheeled in for the anaesthetic. Beautiful, I won't name him, but wonderful um, professor operated on me. Top surgeon. Really well-known, renowned top surgeon. And uh, so I got a little bit maudlin then, boys and girls, I did. I felt a bit, um, because I walk an awful lot and I'm quite healthy and I don't eat like I used to, but I'm still heavy. I'm still, a f I'm, f I'm coming in around 15 stone seven. That's about 220 pounds for my American uh, cousins. And that's not good on a five foot eight frame. So something, why don't I commit to you guys that by day 90 you'll have a stone gone, huh? How about that? 14 pounds. I have to do something. Um, yeah, so I got a bit sad then. But I'm very lucky because there's all new shopping centres around where I am. So I had night school on in Blackrock um, Village later on because I'm going back to my book, my writing, digital uh, writing, uh, marketing and all that stuff. And um, had a cup of coffee in a place. My daughter, who's now in Spain, used to take her laptop to study, so... Felt a bit sad, but amazing technology as well. Took a picture of the Nero coffee mug, sent it to her. Within seconds, she's back, you know, she's on to me from Madrid saying, hey, Dad, I missed that coffee. And I said, well, I'll get you one when you come back in March for a week or two. So you don't really need to know about all that stuff, do you? But I, I did feel a bit Johnny No Mates. I was sitting down at one stage on my own. Now, it's good to be alone. But I felt because I get so isolated in here, at times. Now it is changing. I'm getting out more. Um, social skills. Things like, I thought, well, I go to a McDonald's. And then I thought, I'm not sure how to work those machines that you press. I know it's sad. 60 years of age. I'm going, but I used to bring my kids in here. I'm going, mm, yeah, but I'm afraid of the machines that they're able to work really quickly. I know. So it's just, it happens. You can go in on yourself and you can, well, I won't, but people can get timid when they're deprived of social contact. And by the way, with heart disease and stuff, by the way, they find those that are, you know, that are kind of isolated often suffer from heart disease. Just saying. Anyway, yeah. As Bono says, I don't really want to be the guy who's talking about my surgery. So I won't be talking about surgery. So, um, 
Oh, just mad juxtaposition. I'm going to tell you a really disturbing but true story. So do do hold on, right? But I have to get this out of my soul. Um, do you know when you ever come across mad juxtapositions, you know, just mad things side by side? There is a Chinese restaurant. No, it's a takeaway. And it's lovely. I like it anyway. It does great spice bags. No wonder I've I've got me bypass. Anyway, um... But right beside it, there's like a funeral parlour. Have you been in the presence of a dead person? I know I have. It doesn't happen for years and years and then suddenly you get a glut of them. And uh, I have a vision of somebody dead, laid out in a kitchen and like salad or something nearby. And I just... Ugh. But anyway, there's this restaurant or takeaway and beside it is the, you know, I'm th I'm saying to myself, within 20 feet probably of where they serve, there's possibly people lying dead. Uh, it's all life though, isn't it? Like, it's like life goes on, you know. Let's get, let, let's get rid of the um, prawn crackers here. We've got a business to run and then somebody else is running a... Uh, a funeral parlour. There's people dying to get into it. Oh, that's not good. But I will say, yeah, I have this memory as being a young sales guy back in the 80s and in an area around Rahini in Dublin. And back then I was selling copiers for Xerox. And I was in with another sales guy because I was the junior guy. So two of us were in senior and junior. And honest to God, the uh, undertaker who ran the place, funeral director, he really was like Vincent Price. And it was lashing rain and it was a dull day and we were trying to sell him a copier and of course there's bodies lying in the back and everything. And I said to him, it's a terrible old day, isn't it? And he rubbed his hands and he looked out the window and he said, mm, good for business though. <laughs> oh, he was... That was just so inappropriate, but funny at the same time. I mean, he was a funeral director. The way he rubbed his hands. But good for business, though. What do you think of that, Susan? Is that funny? Is that Irish humour, is it? Yeah. Um, well, my mother had a big thing about... Um, is it Yorkshire where the... Um, is that where the moors are, is it? Well, I know there's moors in Yorkshire. But no, you know um, the, the, the Brontes. Is that Yorkshire, is it? My mother used to go there all the time. She was into the Brontes and she'd go to that village. You know, she'd wheel my dad over every so often. He'd go over with her. It was a thing they did in their 50s and 60s. They'd visit oh, How Howart. Howart. How art thou? So, what have I done? I've talked about Prince. I've said hello to everybody, I hope, and if I've left anyone out, don't feel left out. Um, let people know about this podcast if you do like it. And please contribute your own ideas that we can expand upon and all the rest of it. It does me good that there's a few of you out there listening. And thank you. Um, yes. Okay. Now, you may have heard this story because I saw 11 million hits against it. But it was years ago that it peaked. This was on YouTube. I can't remember. I was going to include the lady who told the story tonight, but I can't remember where the hell the video was. Right. So let me just explain to you why this is disturbing but true. So there was a filmmaker in the early to mid-1970s who went around the United States, him and his crew, and um, they would film kind of old-timers and get the stories from bygone times told by the people that had lived them. And there was one lady... And she was quite elderly. She was 89 years of age. So they were. it was a wrap, basically, and the crew were getting ready to go. And she says to this guy who was the producer or director, she went over and she gave him a kiss right on his lips. And she said, before you go, I have a story for you. And he filmed her relating this story. And that's the bit of film that I was looking for to put down here because she can tell it better than I can. Um, now, she's long with the angels because... At that stage in the 1970s, she was 89. So 
I mean, we pray for her lovely soul, but she told this very disturbing so- story and it's as follows. Are you sitting comfortably? Because you won't be for long. So you've got to cast your mind back to Midwest America, kind of dirt poor, shit kicking times, the late 19th century, early 20th century, and very austere, poverty stricken. But also the people in this particular area were Puritan in nature. They'd probably come across on, on the Mayflower or whatever it was. They're kind of puritanical. No dancing allowed in the same vein as Footloose. Do you remember that film? Yeah. Actually, it's filmed, but that was filmed in Utah. And I had good friends in Utah and I used to, anyway, go over and visit them. But, so it was, it was these times where everybody kind of worked hard, but they had these dour, boring faces. Think kind of keeping it simple and not getting involved with too much excitement, like, say, maybe the Amish or Amish, that kind of vibe. And there was this family, and they weren't very, like a lot of them, they weren't very well off. And they had a daughter, and she was only about 14 years of age. So they were, they had visitors one day, known to the family. And the visitor says, the visitor said, hey, look, we've got connections over in the, in the cotton field, several miles away. We can get, Emmeline was her name, we can get Emmeline some work over there if you want, it'll help, she can make some money and send it back to you guys, it'll help contribute to the family. And back then, 14 was kind of, you know, you, you could work or be exploited, depending on your point of view. So this young girl, really, on the verge of, you know, uh, into her teens, uh, 14, year, 14 years of age, um, was taken away and she went away and she worked in the fields, hard in the cotton fields. And she, she, spell on, she fell under the spell of, let's just say, some young bucko's charms. And while she was falling, she also fell pregnant. Now, back then, it was the worst thing to be out of wedlock. And so she ended up back home where she was essentially ostracized for the shame she had uh, brought upon the family. And she led a very lonely life. And she went and she worked locally in the fields there and, and stuff. And But it was noticed that she she didn't mix with people now, partly because she was being ostracized, but she, she kept herself to herself. And it was a terrible existence for her. It was no existence, really. She just went from day to day, working in the fields and not interacting with many people. And those that she did interact with were probably sour-faced, up their own arse gits. Sorry. But that's where it was. Boring, dry shites, as we'd say in Ireland. <laughs> but anyway, the fear was you'd become an old maid. So she hit 21 years of age and like there was talk, is she going to become an old maid, a spinster? This was like one of the worst things that could happen to you because she was showing no interest at all in the young men. Um, and time went on, and then she got into her late 20s. Same thing was happening. And the fear was, oh my God, she's nearly 30 now, and she hasn't found um, a partner. Nobody wants to be with the woman who had the child, plus she doesn't seem to care anyway for the menfolk here. And one day this young man rode into town, and he was a, a good bit younger than her, um, but they got on well. And they started seeing each other. They, f they formed a relationship. And good news, eventually they got married. And they had this little cottage of a place. It was poor, um, as times were hard. Um, but they were happy. And she, for the first time in her life, was relating to a... Um, a man she she loved, and he loved her. Despite the age difference, it, it, it was working. And one day, his family, or her new in-laws, they decided to visit over from Massachusetts. I never pronounced that. I made a good stab at it, though, didn't I? Massachusetts. There you go. That's perfect, I think. Anyway, the family, the in-laws came over to meet her, 
And during the meeting and, and visiting and the meal and all that, the in-law suddenly had a, a penny drop. She'd married her own son. Emmeline had married her own son. So, of course, the marriage couldn't last. Um, they parted. I'm sure it must have been traumatic for both of them. Uh, the family, everything, more shame, total ostracization. Ostrac anyway, she was sent to Coventry. Again, and she had a horrific, bloody, lonely life. People are such fuckers sometimes, such judgmental, especially with that puritanical streak that was going on. Sometimes religion has a lot, or people's interpretation of it has a lot to answer for. And she, she lived this lonely, decrepit, isolated existence, minus love, minus somebody for companionship, Minus someone to make love to. Minus someone just to touch them and hug them and let them know that they were loved. And the weather changed as it did always around winter time, And there came a few years down the road where the snows were very high. And one of the men, um, who was a postman I think, he called by one day just to see. Just to see. There were some good Samaritans, you know. How was Emmeline doing and... He knocked on the door and he didn't get an answer for long, the longest time. and But eventually he heard this terrible moaning coming out of the shack. So he forced the door open and he, he found Emmeline on the ground, fetal position, moaning, moaning, half starved to death. She had been ill and she hadn't eaten. Um, the snows had risen. He ran, to, he got on his horse to get help. Um, but the proper horse with the carriage couldn't be found to take her to medical um, or to take her to a doctor. The next farm on, the same thing. The horses, the men with the horses were out. He came back anyway and he managed to get her onto his horse, but she, di she had died at that stage. He took the body. So she was laid out in her family home. And... The coffin was open and her sister walked up to the coffin, placed her hand on her on Emmeline's dead face and placed her other hand in the air, almost victory st uh, style. This is her sister now. And she says, at last she's paid for her sins. Or her sin. Not everybody agreed with that in the village, but most people said nothing. And that's how Emmeline's sad, lonely life ended. Now, it's a true story. Only the facts have been changed. No, I, no, I shouldn't have said that. It's a true story. And that lady, age 89, related it on a 1970s TV programme. So there you go. When you think you have it hard, there you go. Now, I'm going to leave you and love you. You can see up here behind me the man who chased joggers. I'm not asking you to buy it. It's there on audiobook and it's there on, um, on Amazon. And it uh, took the publishing world by cam when I released it. In <laughs> see what I did there? It took the publishing world by cam. It still continues to wither on the vine. But a lot of my life went into that book. Um, I'm not going to sell it to you. The reason it's here is there is a scene in the book. Very quickly, there's a guy and he had been a wheeler dealer. He's a, he's a Dubliner. Um, he'd gone across to London. He'd made a lot of money. He lost a run of himself, started taking class A type substances, etc. And he had a, a beautiful English wife and he had two beautiful daughters who he doted on. They're only kids. They're only like six and eight years of age or something. Um, but because of his stupidity, he loses he loses them, and he they, he loses them to a Germanic type Richard Branson, right? I'm trying to remember the character's name, um, but yeah, yeah, Klaus or something like that. He loses them, and the whole story is how is he going to get them back together? And he fig anyway. I don't want to sell it to you. It's there if you ever want to read the blurb on it. Uh, actually, I'll put a link 
I'll put a link at the bottom. Not not for you to buy, um, but you'll see the blurb. Then you can decide whether you want to spend whatever it is, $2.99 or whatever. Anyway, but have a look at the blurb anyway, because it'll explain a lot about the cover. You might be seeing the sexy arse here and you're going, that's very sexist. Don't, I will change that in time. Somebody said sex up the cover. I, I had a very plain cover before. Anyway, you can see there's, there's four key television programmes. If you read the blurb, you'll see what they mean. Anyway, he he ends up in an old Georgian house, which is divided up into flats, run by an old lady who's the landlady. And he his um, roommate is an ex-army, Irish army, Sergeant, something like that. A real hell, yeah, how's it going, you know? He's a real one of those, re- re- you know, he was in the army and all it's bollocks, right? So Jerry is the protagonist. Um, but in this, in this house, this old Georgian house, there's a night a storm takes place and he's with a Scottish lady who he fancies. They haven't got it on yet, so to speak. She's a bit younger than him. She's 27. He's like 49 or something. And the wind is like ferreting up through the... If you can imagine, you know, the preempting of a storm, you know, you get the vibe, you feel it in the air kind of thing. I remember I was in uh, Cuba years ago and you could feel the hurricane. It, it did take place when I was there, Hurricane Irene, back in 19... 2000, I think. Anyway, anyway, you get this vibe and it's coming in off the Dublin coast that just down the road here. The, uh, the house is in Donnybrook. And the atmosphere is there. They're looking out the window. They can see people wrestling with um, umbrellas being blown in the wind. The fireplace starts making these weird noises and the flames start shuddering around. And the phenomenon occurs to do with an entity, entity, but that's later. What he's noticed before is quite a few of the apartments in within the house are unoccupied. And sometimes maybe once or twice in the whole book, but a noise comes up through the floorboards and it's music. It's a music, barely audible. And he often says to himself, where's that music coming from? Because there's nobody in the apartment below. It, it, it's like ethereal music, the faintest audible noise coming up and I'm going to leave you with what it is 15 summers Gallagher and Lyle good night Fifteen summers and you're trying to tell me just how long this world can be Fifteen songs You say you're the only
happens.